all so much for coming to hear this conversation with Claire Hunter. And uh, welcome to the Pisa Book Festival 2019, third day. It is an absolute joy and honor to have her here at the festival in Pisa to talk about her recent book, Threads of Life, a history of the world through the eye of a needle. So, welcome to Pisa, Claire, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Claire Hunter has seen since she was a child. She, was, she has been a banner maker and a community textile artist for over 20 years. After working as art, arts consultant in London in 1985, she established the Community Enterprise Needle Works in Glasgow, which won the Arts Working for Cities Award. She was a finalist of the Aesthetica Creative Writing Award and the recipient of a Creative Scotland Award in 2016. She lives near Stirling in Scotland. And uh, Threads of Life is going to be published in Italian as well by Bollati Boringhieri. So it's going to be available in our language. In August. In August 2020. Uh, with us on stage, I'm glad to have Joe Farrell, and he certainly needs no introduction here in Pisa, but nonetheless, um, <laughs> Professor of Italian Literature at the University of Glasgow, is an expert on Italian theater, as well as a translator from Italian into English. His most recent book is going to be presented tomorrow here at the festival at two o'clock, and you're, you're all very welcome to come. Um, it's a biography of Dario Fo and Franca Rame, recently published by Metwin. He published in Italian as well, an um, interview with Franca Rame and another one with Dacia Moraini. So please, a warm welcome to Joe and Claire. Before passing the microphone, I'm just going to say that uh, Threads of Life is a very rich book and uh, a fascinating uh, um, history of sewing. It takes you into so many lives uh, and it has so many details. Um, it is a history uh, told through the um, stories of women and also some men are in the book, uh, over centuries and across continents and the history of people who have used the language of sewing to say something. Because as Claire said, um, sewing, it's a language, and sewing, uh, it has a voice. And I'm so glad you're here because the topic of having a voice, the topic of identity, I find it still very crucial nowadays. So let's start this uh, conversation about uh, threads of life. Okay. Well, you may remember in Alice in Wonderland when Alice meets one of the creatures and she says she has a story to tell and she doesn't know where to begin and she's given the good advice, begin at the beginning, go on to the end and then stop. Um, I do not propose to follow that advice precisely. I would like to begin... Uh, or inviting Claire to talk, to begin with chapter 13, where Claire explains um, the nature of embroidery or the nature of um, sewing. So, we will come back and talk about your own interest in sewing, but could you give us your own account of what you say here, that it's all a matter of string, as you say? Uh, before we move on to that, it might be very nice and so if just for you to hear a little bit of the book so you get a feel for the sound of it. So, Sylvia, would you like to read that first paragraph? Thank you. It's going to be in Italian. Certe notti i tessuti entrano nei miei sogni. Un tremolio di stendardi illuminati dalla luna traccia pennellate di colore sullo specchio di un lago. 
Metri e metri di morbida seta lucente vengono affidati alle acque di un fiume dai contadini radunati lungo la sponda, a osservare in silenzio la tela che la corrente trascina verso il mare. Quasi sempre, però, l'ambientazione del sogno è più prosaica, un magazzino deserto, un polveroso negozio dell'usato pieno di vestiti abbandonati sugli stand. Passo la mano tra le stoffe dismesse da chissà quanto tempo. Crepe de Chine, raso duchesse, tulle, sfiorando con le nocche una decorazione di perline, lisciando una languida frangia, accarezzando il brel del pizzo, accompagnando con le dita il ritmo dei plissé. Risumagli di splendore esausto, scartati, oggetti di cui sbarazzarsi, sconosciute le mani che li crearono. Al risveglio provo sempre una sensazione di perdita, una fitta più acuta di quella che può darti un tessuto reale, perché i tessuti che tocco nei miei sogni non sono mai esistiti, non c'è speranza che qualcuno li riscopra. It's very dreamy. Bellissima, grazie. So to string, um, I, and, and as Joe said, later on in the book, I go right back to 20,000 BC to talk about where sewing came from. And of course, it all did start with string. Once people knew how to use uh, natural fiber plants and twist them to make string, then animals could be tethered, things could be carried, and string fell to women because basically they could then spin it and twist it near to home and still be in charge of childcare and cooking. But when string was invented, it wasn't just used for practical things. Interestingly, people began to make of it decorative costume. Decorative costume as, a, in a sense, a sexual aid to attract the most virile of men and ensure that communities would stay in, continu in, in it would continue. And so they began to decorate it, they began to embroider into it, weave beads in. And there are many ancient examples, both in figurines and in the residue of uh, fragments of twine itself, which show how people very early on used a form of decorative embellishment in fibers uh, to make themselves more alluring and also to then uh, start traditions which stayed within their own clans. And as part of that, because it was women who, who made that string, then string itself became endowed with uh, magical properties um, because they couldn't believe that magical transformation from something that was a natural plant into, to bring into, into being something else which had never existed before. It was the spring of life. And so women became, and sewing became associated with the magical properties of bringing things into being. Very good. Um, I want to continue with this chapter which is entitled Value, Valore. Now, there are two aspects which are very interesting in this chapter and which um, imbue the whole book. First of all, and you've already mentioned this, that um, sewing embroidery became identified as women's work and so you suggest that sometimes it was given a secondary value, although at other times some men were involved. Would you like to talk to us about this identification quasi-identification um, of sewing as women's work and what the impact and the consequences of that were? Well, as I say, in ancient cultures, sewing was very much part of that traditional identity. Um, but as we moved into court life, as we moved into ecclesiastical power, then embroidery itself became a status of power. Um, and a way of, um, of, of, of um, displaying education, taste, sophistication, and wealth. And then both male embroiderers and female embroiderers became involved in professional guilds. Um, 
and those girls in, in, in those days, medieval times, by medieval times, then embroidery was seen as the highest art form, above painting, above illuminated manuscript, because it was through the texture of embroidery, through the use of gold and silver threads, through the luxuriant fabrics on which it was based, and through the endowment of, of, of actual precious jewels, that the light of God could be animated. So the spiritual, the spiritual power of embroidery was uh, much used. And the Vatican in Rome owned over a hundred pieces of incredibly intricate and very, very inordinately expensive embroidery. But with the Black Plague in the um, 1500s, then a lot of the patrons of embroidery um, basically died. And with the Reformation of the 16th century, then the Catholic religion itself was under threat, as were its iconography and its textiles. And as the trade of embroidery became more threatened, then women were pushed out of the guilds. They could no longer become apprentices, they couldn't have workshops, and they were given the lower forms of embroidery, no longer the embroiderers of gold work, but more the simpler forms of embroidery. And by the 18th century, we see the worlds of um, dom the domestic worlds and the professional worlds becoming divided, with um, the manufacturing administrative base for industry becoming part of city life and women becoming more sequestered in the home in charge of household management. And of course, they took their sewing skills with them and therefore sewing became seen increasingly through the 17th, 18th and 19th century as a domestic activity. All right. Can we develop that just a little further? Because in this same chapter, having spoken about string, first of all, you then begin to move both in history and also to move in geography. So I discover very quickly in this chapter a reference to wedding dresses worn by women in Uzbekistan. And at the same time, you talk about the impact of the medieval plague, the Black Death, the impact that that had. So, can you give us some idea of your own travels in uh, writing this book and what differentiation you found in style and also in the status or the importance given to embroidery or sewing in various countries and in various points in history matters which you do discuss um, very accessibly and very interestingly in this book? Well, I think the most interesting thing I found when I travelled, it has to be said not hugely widely, maybe across continents, but not to many, many countries, was I realised that what's happened, in, particularly in, uh, in Europe, is that we've lost the visibility of sewing. It used to be a time when I was young, when you would go into small villages and there would be groups or knots of, of women sitting out on a sunny doorstep embroidering uh, because it was still much, very much part of family traditions. And I'm sure many of you here would have grandmothers uh, or mothers who you witnessed sewing for the home or for the, or, for, or for the family or for important occasions, either as gifts or as part of family heirlooms. When I went to China in 1995, I went in search of a particular kind of Chinese embroidery that belonged to one of the minority clans called the Miao. And I had learnt that the Miao made what they called story cloths because they had no written language and so they used their embroideries as their books. They used them to narrate their myths, to conserve their history, and to um, protect their traditions. And when I went there, the area in southwest China that I, I traveled through had only been opened up both to other Chinese and to uh, visitors only seven years before. So these communities, in a sense, were frozen in time. And there, in those villages, sewing was visible. 
the women sat, as used to be the case in many other cultures, on sunny afternoons, embroidering their, their what was a visual language onto cloths in many different ways. And indeed, I did find their story cloths. So I think that was the thing that left an indelible impression on me, was how much we have lost of the witnessing of the creativity of sewing. And we see sewing largely now, particularly in, in the West, as a manufactured activity. All right. Let's change direction just a little. We've spoken then about the ancient beginnings of this art or craft. Let's talk a bit more autobiographically, because you do, in this book, describe your own journey of discovery. So, can you tell us, Claire, at what point did you become interest, interested in the art of sewing? What kind of activities have you been involved with either yourself or with, um, with other women. Can you tell us something about how this interest developed? Uh, well, I learned to sew, as again, um, people in the room will have done, uh, by being taught by my mother. Uh, but interestingly, my mother taught me embroidery, not plain sewing. She wasn't an embroiderer herself. And so my kind of uh, realization that she taught me embroidery I think um, I realised that she taught me it because I was quite a curious child. I was always asking questions. She had f three other children. My father worked away a lot. And she wanted to find an occupation that would keep me still and keep me uh, absorbed and, and basically allow her to have more time to get on with the things that she had to do. And of course, embroidery is a very absorbing pastime. And she took me to a shop in Glasgow, which was a kind of Aladdin's cave of coloured embroidery threads and beautiful scissors and, and cloths already stamped with floral motifs. And it allowed me to choose what I wanted. And once I had started to embroider, I think that idea of starting off with a plain printed piece of cream or white cotton, and then suddenly, through your own efforts, seeing it emerge as something that becomes ever more beautiful by what you're embroidering into it, was to me a revelation. So it started there, and then of course, as a girl, then I had my dolls, and I wanted my dolls to be the best dressed dolls in Scotland. And so I started to make them extraordinary elaborate ball dresses with, again, embroidery and beading, etc. And then moved on to making my own clothes, to making family clothes, to making gifts at Christmas, using sewing as part of that. But I wanted to actually study sewing. I, I had dreams of becoming a fashion designer or a theatre costume designer. And I very much wanted to go to college to study those things. But my school saw me as a, 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 that I had potential for academic study. And so I was not allowed to do those things and instead went to university and did English and history. Uh, but years on, I got involved politically through uh, the minor strike in, in Britain in 1984, through women's activism and things like the Greenham Common Peace Camp, um, of, of basically um, beginning to see a whole other use of needlework as a political tool, as a political agent in the, in the creation of large-scale banners that told about what was important to change in the world and what it was that people cared about. And at that point, I had become involved in a, in a movement in Britain called Community Arts, which was about artists working with communities, mostly those communities most marginalized from public life, to try and find creative ways to give them a meaningful voice in their worlds. And I saw, therefore, through these banners, a way of actually working with communities to create large-scale public artworks in which people could document their history, document their activities, their aspirations, and, in a sense, the inequalities that they suffered from. And that's when I went back to Scotland and set up a company called Needleworks. Uh, which was about working with local people in all in different kinds of settings. It might be an old people's home, it might be a school, it might be a museum, and through working with in, in small projects and large projects, bringing 
people together across generations, across cultures, to sow something that told of their lives. Well, talking about banners, Claire, there is a chapter in the book which is um, titled Protest, and uh, you wrote about the suffragette movement. Uh, and uh, the incredible visual shows that they made uh, during the rallies. Uh, so why do you call it a sensory demonstration? Why did they need to be feminine with their banners? Uh? Well, with the suffragettes, they had um, uh, many years of doing peaceful um, uh, petitioning to government for women to have the right to vote. And by the end of the... Um, 19th uh, the, the, sorry, the, the, yes, 19th century, then they were no further forward. And so in 1903, uh, the Women's Social and Political Union was formed with a much more intemperate and violent agenda to basically storm the barricades of, of, of male power. And so they bombed politicians' houses, they smashed windows in high street stores, they invaded Parliament itself, unfurling a banner which demanded their rights. But they beca began to be ridiculed. They began to be ridic ridiculed as harridans, who, as I say, were anarchists, and they began to lose public sympathy. So they had to find another strategy, both to hold on to the support that they had mustered, and also to find another way of increasing support across the country. And they decided, as Sylvia said, on mass rallies, thousands of women coming together across the country to march through London, Edinburgh, the capital cities of Britain. But they wanted it to be a spectacle. They wanted for the public to um, understand that they were actually women who had capacity and had presence. And they, to do that, they then decided to organize a major banner-making project. But the banners they made were very, very different from the usual banners seen in Britain at that time, the trade union banners. Instead, they made banners that were exquisitely embroidered. They made banners taking the fabrics from the drawing room, the velvets, the silks, the brocades, and putting them out onto the streets. And the reason why they did that is because they had been criticized as being desex, of being unwomanly by their protests. And so what they wanted to do was emphasize their femininity, emphasize the fact that this was women walking together in their thousands in solidarity and in power, but doing it through feminine arts. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Another question about uh, women, one woman in particular. So Mary of Scotland, Mary Stewart, you are also writing a book about her from, uh, can I if I can anticipate this. Um, in Renaissance Europe, uh, uh, embroidery was the one of the strongest form of, uh, ran of communication. Yes. And Mary of Scotland is no exception, though this is a part of her, a part of a history which is scarcely mentioned by historians. And uh, you write about this and you say that for her, sewing, uh, it was no hobby, uh, it had a purpose. So what was this purpose for Mary? Well, for those of you, uh, many of you might know Mary of Queen of Scots' story, but basically she went over to France at the age of five uh, as the um, prospective bride of the Dauphin. The Queen of France at that point was Catherine de' Medici, um, and Catherine de' Medici had learnt her embroidery in the convents where she was secreted when the Medici family itself was under threat and she was often to be seen embroidering what were, what were called lacquer work, small pieces of mesh which were then put together on other larger hangings. And Mary Queen of Scots would have witnessed this on a daily basis. But we're talking about the time of the Renaissance where visual language 
was the most potent form of communication in both uh, uh, populations, which were largely illiterate if it was part of a public spectacle, but also amongst nobles of themselves, who were often international. In any Renaissance court, you would have had a vast number of people who came from other countries, because it was a time of both influx of, of artisans coming into court life, and obviously of intermarriage between European nations. And so the visuality of needlework was another form of communication. It was also a sophisticated language because it dwelt on the idea of visual image play linked to text, mottos, emblems, uh, impressa, different forms of telling people not only who you were in terms of your dynastic lineage, but also about um, what your education was, reference to your knowledge of the classics, which was part of the chivalric um, um, humanist movement of that time. And also maybe what your hopes and aspirations were by the symbolic motifs you chose as your own emblem. So it was a very rich, multi-layered language that sadly now we can no longer read exactly, although we know some of, some of the, the, the meanings behind it, but in those days which people of education could read and read its subtleties. Embroidery itself was an elite women's occupation, while sewing was something that everybody did because everything that anybody wore, anything that was actually in, um, in, a, in a home or in a court was obviously hand sewn. Uh, so everybody could sew, but embroidery demanded access to very expensive materials in those days, to silk threads, to slender needles, which weren't usually manufactured um, in, um, in the place that you were. And so they had to be imported at huge cost. And so it was an, an elite women's, noble women's art. And when Mary Queen of Scots came back to Scotland, she then used textiles as a way to assert her dynastic lineage, as I say, in the face of both a feeling that it wasn't right, that women should rule at all, that becoming a sovereign was a, was a male uh, um, privilege, um, and also to show the Scottish court which after various battles had been demoralized to really restore Scottish, the, the status of, Scottish, uh, of the Scottish court of Scotland as an important power within Europe, using the most expensive materials and, as I say, the language that she put on bed hangings, on, on, on wall hangings, etc. But when she was taken into captivity, originally as a as in, in refuge from um, from Scotland, um, and then as a political uh, prisoner in England, then she began to use embroidery at a time when her letters were intercepted uh, as an as an alternative form of communication to her supporters, because it, as I, as I say, it was seen as a language that could be read by other nobles, not necessarily by the administrative class. And she then embroidered various um, aspects of, of, um, of what she wanted to say, both as um, treasonable uh, correspondence with her supporters, but also as a way of creating a, a, an autobiography that was unedited by others. Um, okay, it's me again. Can we go back to the first chapter of your book? Um, one of the a particular object which is very well known in Britain, in the United Kingdom, perhaps less so in Italy, the Bayer Tapestry, Arazzo di Bayer, um, which is a celebration of the Norman conquest of England at the time of the expansion of the Normans into Sicily, the Mezzogiorno and elsewhere. Now, this tapestry is very well known, as I say, in Britain. And you use this in the first chapter. Now, um, could you tell us then briefly, because I do want to talk about some of the other aspects, or allow you to talk about some of the other aspects of um, sewing and embroidery. Could you tell us why you begin with this tapestry? Could you tell us about your own emotions 
um, when you saw it. And maybe give us but just very briefly something of the history of this once it was completed, um, how it was used as an icon in France as much as in England. Uh, so the Bayer Tapestry, 900 years old, one of the few surviving embroideries that we have of that, of, um, that time in Europe. Um, basically unknown for its first 500 years, apart from an odd um, few days when it used to be brought out for the Feast of Relics in Bayer Cathedral. Um, it's, it's six to eight metres long. Uh, and it's a narrow frieze, which, as Joe says, is the narrative of the Battle of Hastings. Uh, thought to have been designed by Bishop Stollard, of, um, uh, so designed by a man, commissioned by Bishop Otto of Bayeux, uh, the um, brother-in-law of William the Conqueror, uh, and thought to be sewn by uh, both noblewomen and nuns from convents around the city of Canterbury in England. Uh, the interesting thing to me is that I had seen through my life lots of images of the Bayer Tapestry because it's often used um, as a greeting card, it's used as, as a form of cartoon, uh, and it's always represented in the many needlework books that I own. But I'd never actually seen it until I wrote the book. And when I went to see it, what amazed me was how its physical presence really animated that story that I had no idea until I saw it how skilled the embroiders had been with only four kinds of stitch, only four colors of thread to bring, bring alive the emotional life of battle, both the emotional life of the soldiers who took part in that battle, the emotional life of the, of the powers that were at war with each other and the tragedy of the soldiers who died during it. And they did that by using their materials so cleverly, so with such expertise. And that, it came to me that actually that is why it has lasted in public admiration for so long, not because of its scale, but because of actually when you go to see it, it still has an emotional pull, which takes us back to those embroiders at that time, 900 years ago. Its history is interesting, I'll try and be short with it, as I say, it wasn't seen for 500 years until Napoleon um, brought it to the Louvre in Paris as part of his propagandist campaign when he was wanting to invade England. Uh, while it was there, uh, a Halley's Comet was seen over the skies of Paris and it echoed the Halley's Comet which was actually embroidered on the, on the Bayer tapestry, um, which, uh, which, which, was, which heralded the defeat of the English. And so he, summer, he sent it back to Bayer because he was worried that it might be a portent of his own defeat. It was then um, it, it rescued um, at, at various times from being completely dismantled, one for a carnival, etc., etc. And then uh, when the Nazis invaded France, then um, when the Germans invaded France, then Himmler um, basically took possession of the Bayer tapestry. He had it documented intensively, made films of it, he had it sketched, he wrote reports, or had reports written about it. And when it was the, um, the, the final coup de grace, of the Nazis to then raise Paris to the ground. He saved the Bayer tapestry. He had it uh, um, put in a, in, a, um, in a big container in the Louvre. And then just before that event, uh, he then dispatched a message which was intercepted by uh, the code breakers in Britain to, uh, from Germany to say, make sure the Bayer tapestry gets safely to Germany. And indeed, when the Gestapo or the Nazis turned up at the Louvre to claim the tapestry, the French resistance were already there to save it, and it stayed in France. Okay. Now, the chapters in this book are given very precise single word titles, as Claire identifies various uses and aspects of embroidery or sewing. So, to read a couple of the titles we have unknown, then power, then frailty, then captivity, then identity, and so on. I'd like you, Claire, to talk 
about some of the aspects of the chapter 10 entitled Loss. Because here we have poignant accounts of the use of banners. And to show the width of this book, you discuss some Americans who, at the outbreak of the AIDS uh, epidemic, used um, tapestry or sewing. Um, some women in Allende's Chile who behaved in the same way, and then also some Jewish families in Poland at the time of Nazism. So, would you then like to discuss th this particular use, which is not purely decorative, but which is a kind of cry of protest against uh, wrongs which are being perpetrated on these people? Yes, I suppose, again, the most fascinating part of that is why those different people chose needlework, chose cloth to then document loss. And for me, it's because um, cloth itself is tactile, it's textural, and through that it can basically um, um, rekindle a personality rekindle the spirit of somebody who has been lost. In, in the middle of the AIDS crisis, when both politicians and public seemed disinterested in the thousands of deaths that were happening to the gay community in uh, America, uh, the gay activists decided they wanted to create a, a different kind of memorial to those who died of AIDS and invited people to sew a panel three foot by six foot the size of a burial plot. And 2,000 panels were then laid out on the mall in Washington, D.C. as a carpet of remembrance. But each of those small panels each held the story of one person who had died from AIDS. And it not only basically personified the individuals who up to that point had only been seen as statistics, uh, but it, it, it brought them to life and also it created a visual um, point of both um, celebration of those lost lives, but also of um, protest about the fact that there wasn't attention paid to the scale of that devastation uh, that was caused through AIDS. By the end of, of the, that huge campaign over the next years, which was called the Names Memorial Project, there were 40,000 cloths made across the world. In Chile, at the time of um, uh, 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 the coup in Chile, uh, then basically uh, the, the country was annexed from the, uh, from the outside world uh, and people weren't able to express or tell of what was happening in that country, of the murders, of the imprisonment, etc., of thousands of people. So a group of women from the shanty towns began to make small appliqued panels, little, using little scraps of fabric, some fabric that maybe had been taken from the shirt of a dead son or from the jacket of a dead father, and they made the, these little sewn documentaries about the atrocities that people were suffering in Chile, and they exported them uh, secretly out to the West to alert the West as to what was the real situation in that country. And the, 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 these small panels, Chilean patchworks, arperelas, as they're called, became a form of the West developing support and um, outrage uh, in, in uh, other countries to force the fall of the, of the Chilean government at that point. It's wonderful how you define them, the guardians of a nation's memory, these women in Chile. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, that they were then um, protecting, um, well, they were both doing two things. They were commemorating the people they had lost for themselves. So there was a personal... Uh, therapy in creating these small patchworks, as well as taking a public role in saving their country and bringing it back to democracy. Sewing has so many aspects that uh, uh, I didn't think about before reading this book. And um, so one is this way of um, um, telling stories, uh, sending a message, uh, 
but uh, girls in the new world, they actually learn geography with, the, with Suin. And uh, can you tell us more about this emotional journey? As you, as you write in the book? I think the, the different things as I wrote the book was um, uncovering such extraordinary stories. Um, extraordinary stories not just of women, but of men. A lot of the history of, of, of men sewing or the involvement of men in sewing is hardly known. It's very rarely documented. And, and so it was very joyful to discover all sorts of, of different projects that had happened through time in which men were involved, particularly after the First World War and during the Second World War. In the First World War, uh, soldiers, you know, basically exposed to modern welfare, warfare, came back with shell shock and were no longer able to control minds and hands. And embroidery became introduced to the um, convalescent hospitals uh, in order to help them to find through the repetitive rhythm of sewing a way of stilling their hands and through um, their, um, and, and again through its, its therapeutic um, um, way of, 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 of the time it takes helping to still minds. It also became a way for them to earn some income because many of those soldiers with huge disabilities were no longer able to provide for their families and therefore no longer had the, the pride of being the family breadwinner. And embroidery for them became a way both of doing that and also still having recognition for skill because many of these men had been artisans before they went to war. And although they came back unable to carry on their previous trade, they found through their embroidered work, the disabled soldiers' embroidery industry, as it was called, a way of still taking part in public life and still becoming somebody who could support their families. Um, so that's a very inspirational movement to me. Um, and also um, the, uh, the idea of um, sewing as, as therapy goes through history. One of the other details, if it is a detail, which I found fascinating, was the way that some women doing this work could leave a mark of their own identity. And I found this especially moving in the account you give of some women who ended up as Japanese prisoners of war during the Second World War after the fall of Singapore, when the women um, and the men were separated and the women were living in desperate circumstances. And in those circumstances they took to preparing some embroidery, but also they were able to sew in something purely personal of themselves. Would you like to tell us about this, Claire? Uh, yes, in the, in the Singapore, in the, in the Shanghai um, prison of war uh, camp, then as, as Joe says, then um, the men and women were separated, women were separated from their families, from their sons, and, um, and, and life was incredibly um, uh, uh, dangerous in terms of the conditions that they were living under. And so they basically began to sew two kinds of things. One was a series of quilts, which they um, persuaded their Japanese guards were for um, the hospital. And these were small um, quilts, patchwork quilts, and each woman sewed a small square. So you might get a, a square that was of a three-piece suite with a standard lamp in somebody's sitting room. Uh, you might get a, a little map of Britain saying homeward bound. Uh, you might get pansies, which were the symbolic of thoughts. And each woman em em embroidered her autograph on those squares. And those quilts went over to the male camp as secret messages to their loved ones. The other thing they did was they sewed signature cloths. And again, if you imagine it in those prisons of war camps, then the women did not know, or men and women did not know, if people knew they were there, if people knew they were still alive, because no news was getting out about the situation in those camps. And through signature cloths, just the embroidering of their names together, then they could actually both 
uh, uh, re reassert their sense of identity and also keep alive their sense of self and their collective solidarity. Uh, and there are amazing examples of those signature cloth. I had a friend, John Cumming, whose mother and father were both in Shangi, and John knew that his mother had embroidered in one of those quilts, and so I knew that the Red Cross in London had, uh, had that quilt there, and I went with John to see it. And we found the embroidery his mother had done under her maiden name, Marion Williams, and it was of a little angel, a, bl a blue frocked angel clutching a little posy of white flowers. But then I began to look into more of the collection at the Imperial War Museum, and I found that John's mother, Marion Williams, had embroidered her name over and over and over again on many different cloths, because as I say, what she was trying to do was keep her identity alive and basically um, assert her presence. And the um, uh, men embroidered in prison camps as well, they were all issued with sewing kits, and so you have wonderful examples. There was Major Alex Cascali, who was in one of the German prisoner of war camps, and he then created all sorts of embroideries, laying out the prison conditions, illustrating the prison conditions he was living under, um, uh, sending messages back home, and often his, um, the work he was doing was quite subversive in that he'd used symbolic language in sewing to then denounce what was happening uh, in, in the, the Hitler regime. All right, there are various monsters in this story as well. And can I talk about one who perhaps does not entirely deserve the name of monster. I mean Mr. Singer of America, who devised the sewing machine, Machina per Cucire. Claire, do you regard the invention of the sewing machine as the end of a particular kind of tradition? Um, I was astonished to discover that Karl Marx in Das Kapital uh, makes reference to Singer and to his sewing machine. So, how significant was that invention, and what were the what was the impact for good or ill? Well, what was very significant about the sewing machine was that actually, as Joe said, it wasn't heralded by economic thinkers of the time as progress. It was heralded as something that, was a, that endangered the economy of working class people because being by, replaced by a machine would endanger, as did happen, that they would then become um, a menial labour, low paid menial labour, hammering away on sewing machines and that the soul of sewing would be lost forever. Not all of the soul of sewing was lost forever. However, in the industrialization of sewing, the value of sewing as something that was personal, something that had social significance, something that was political, was definitely reduced through our own history. Uh, Singer himself was, uh, um, you know, from a child of 12, was out there in the world trying to make his living. And eventually he decided that the best way to make a fortune was to become an inventor. And it was, due, it was just through accident that he ended up in a workshop while he was trying to organize a prototype for the printing trade, that that workshop was shared with people who were repairing the first ever sewing machines. And he thought he could make a better model because those early machines were so unreliable. And indeed he did. And so through his life and his many, many, many mistresses that he then <laughs> got involved with. Uh, he became a multi-millionaire, making 14 million out of the sewing machine because he then uh, developed it as something that was actually a, um, a sophisticated piece of equipment to have in the drawing room as opposed to having it as part of the servants' quarters. Um, so I don't know how much you want me to talk about Singer, but... Um, Time is short, I feel, and I think uh, some people might have brought things to share. What's really fascinating about your book, um, which makes it a wonderful read, is not just your style and your prose, but it's how you mix global history, then mic micro histories, and 
personal history as well. Uh, you had a lot of fun with the dry cleaners, for example. So it became, uh, so it wasn't just a, a part-time job, uh, wasn't just a way of learn more uh, about sewing, but you learned a lot about life when you were with them and you, you had a lot of fun. So. Yes, I just told a little bit about a, a job that I had as a student when basically I, I, was, I, I went to work at the dry cleaners in Glasgow in Scotland and at the end of the day all the women would sit around the table to mend garments that had come in for their kind of elite service and my job was, to sewing, was supposed to sew on buttons. Uh, I was 17 and I was with... Um, uh, if you like, rough, ready Glasgow women who were very eager to teach me what lay ahead for me in life in terms of, you know, um, disappointing sex, uh, you know, unfaithful husbands, um, difficult children, and, uh, and, and basically a time of care and worry. And I've never laughed so much in my life. Um, and uh, so, so it's one of the, I, I loved the, the idea in the book that I could weave in little stories of, of how I discovered sewing and my experience of sewing to make it, uh, to, to show, I suppose, the relevance that it still has today for all of us as a tactile experience and a, and a social experience that we can share with other people. And that's what I wanted to get across in the book. One last question, and then we would like to ask the public to join the conversation. And some uh, people might have brought, brought yeah. along a textile that they could share Did with us. Did someone bring a, a piece of clothes with them? I know that Nadia has something here. Okay. Nadia, do you want to come and just say a little bit? This is Nadia Della Croce, who's an old friend and who's from Pisa. Hi, good evening. <laughs> yes. Uh, an old friend, uh, a friend of Claire's. And when I heard and read that Claire invited us to bring a meaningful uh, piece of cloth, uh, something that uh, brings back memories to you, that has a strong meaning uh, for you, I soon thought of this. Uh, so I removed it from one of the walls in my house. And here it is, I'll show it to you. Uh, oh, I took an way, yes. Uh, this is not, not only a piece of cloth, this is uh, something that Claire gave me uh, more than 30 years ago, <laughs> gosh, uh, and uh, it's something that she made. It reproduces a pattern or a design by Margaret MacDonald Macintosh, so Rennie Macintosh's uh, wife. I think it is uh, wonderful, not only as a piece of cloth, as you say, it's not simply a piece of cloth uh, as regards embroidery, but because to me, this has a voice, as you said, and that's why it is so visible in my house. Uh, it has a voice, it reminds me of a wonderful year in Glasgow when I met uh, Claire, I met uh, Joseph uh, because uh, I taught Italian at uh, Glasgow University and Strathclyde University. So I can hear uh, the voices of lots of friends. Uh, I can see uh, Glasgow when I look uh, at this. And uh, it really is alive. It's not just uh, a piece of cloth. Uh, the year uh, in Glasgow to me was uh, so meaningful. It really changed my life. It's not a joke. <laughs> it changed my life. And uh, so having something like this uh, at home uh, is uh, great. It's not like looking at a postcard or uh, a book. That was the time when postcards were still alive. <laughs> now they have disappeared. And uh, it, is, um, it is wonderful. Uh, so thank you very much, Claire, for giving it to me. And I will always uh, keep it uh, as something so important uh, to me. So uh, this is what I brought. I don't know if you can share, if you want to share other uh, things. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. All right, we have five minutes. Are there any questions which anyone would like to ask, English or Italian? Okay. A very un Italian silence has now fallen on the place. You can leave. Oh, I'm only... Claire, 
Did you ever meet with the liver of the paper rose that you find at the Edinburgh Book Festival? Did he or she get in touch? Uh, no, they didn't. I'll just explain um, what Sylvia is asking. I start the book with a little thank you to an unknown, uh, anonymous paper artist who in Scotland, as part of her campaign to save libraries, um, basically distributes secretly the incredible paper sculptures to different places that in, in their way celebrate reading, literature and the love and need that we all have of it. And in nine, 2013, I think it was, I was visiting the Edinburgh Book Festival and I found amongst the, the books in the, in the, on, on the bookstalls a paper rose so I took it to the counter to ask how much it was and could I buy it. And they said, oh, actually, no, that's one of 50 roses that's been left by the anonymous paper artist. Um, and I took that rose as a sign. I was, about, I was deliberating at that point whether to do a course on creative writing because I'd always wanted to um, end my days as a writer. And so I took that rose as a talisman for uh, writing it. And I, and I basically vowed to myself that if I ever did write a book, then I would tell the story of that anonymous paper artist and my rose. And so that's the way the book starts. Thank you. Uh, just to uh, finish very quickly, I've brought my tiny little piece of what I keep as my um, special, precious piece of embroidery. It was sewn by my grandmother when my father was a small boy as part of a costume for a school play. My grandmother died before I was born and my father died when I was 19 and we left the house that I grew up in. But I salvaged this tiny little piece of embroidery, which of course has the sense of her own hands and the sense of my father within it. And I feel that when I look at it, when I pick it up, when I touch it, that I connected both to her and to him. And to me, although it's small, and it is, it is as I say, a precious part of my own history. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with Claire Hunter and her book, Threads of Life. Yeah, the books are here available for sale, for, on sale for anyone who's interested. And don't forget, yeah, don't forget there's going to be an Italian version on August um, 2020. And can I just thank Sylvia and Joe Farrell for all their support for this event. Thank you.